Farnborough, 1952. Farnborough has become a famous name in any language, and the Farnborough Show is now firmly established as one of the most important events of the year in Britain. Every year since the war has added to its interest, and each new show demonstrates that the Society of British Aircraft Constructors has managed to improve on the amazing achievements revealed the previous year. The crowds are made up of visitors from all over the world. In the first few days, it's the experts, the potential customers. In the latter days of this September week, it's the public's turn to gaze, wonder and marvel at the new developments which are now on view for all to see and understand. And how many astounding new developments there are. If it was only for the advent of the new Bristol Britannia, the year would have been notable. But in addition, as the new Delta Wing aircraft, the habitual piercing of the sound barrier and the introduction of the comet on the air routes of the world. One of the visitors particularly interested in what he saw was His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh. Now for some miscellaneous camera impressions of the flying display, the civil aircraft first. Here's the de Havilland Heron, a 14 to 17 seater in production for airlines all over the world from Japan to Norway. The Eglet trainer being thrown about by its pilot Ronald Porteous. She's a three-seater product of Auster aircraft designed for flying schools and clubs. In these days of supersonic speeds, it's rare, isn't it, to see aerobatics at such close range. The Skeeter helicopter is a two-seater made by Saunders Rowe. Korea has proved the military value of the small helicopter. Its civilian uses are a challenge to the imagination. By contrast, here's the Bristol 173 helicopter. This is the world's first helicopter to have twin-engine reliability. She can, if necessary, fly on only one of her two engines. The 173, still in the early development stage, is designed to carry about 14 passengers and maybe the city-to-city -city bus of the future. In the meanwhile, we can take pride in the proved successes of today. The Vickers Viscount can claim the honour of having been the first turbine-powered airliner to carry fare-paying passengers in 1950. She's a turboprop type, not a straight jet. More than 50 are now on order for the airlines, including 26 which will fly on the continental routes of British European Airways, carrying up to 53 passengers. You can see how easily she maintains height with three of her engines stopped. The first commercial jet airliner, the most sought-after aircraft in the world, is, of course, the Comet. That's the Comet being used as a test bed to demonstrate, experimentally, rocket-assisted takeoff with the Sprite. Here we show a Canadian Comet due for delivery to Canadian Pacific Airways. De Havilland, with their Comet, shot several years ahead in design for the long-distance air routes of the world. 36 passengers are carried on stages up to 1,750 miles. Later versions will have increased range and will also carry more passengers. They will become familiar in the air and on airfields everywhere. So will the turboprop Britannia, which we've already seen on the ground. But for flights in which the speed of the comet is not all important, the Bristol Britannia is the ideal airliner. She has a large carrying capacity, anything from 60 to 100 passengers. BOAC, who have ordered 26, believe that the design of the Britannia will prove to be the most economical and efficient ever conceived. A lovely, graceful machine, her evolution ranks as a milestone equal to the regular services of the Comet. In that evolution, as in the development of all successful aircraft, the test pilot plays an enormously important part. Fandra, this year, poignantly emphasized the hazardous nature of the test pilot's contribution. Here are a few who put on the marvelous show which this film is trying to picture for you. Peg, Britannia. Trubshaw, the Viscount. Bryce, Vickers Valiant. Tyson, Princess Flying Boat. Beaumont, Canberra Trainer. Lithgow, Vickers 508. Cahoon, the Supermarine Swift. Falk, the Vulcan. Waterton, the Gloucester Javelin. The late John Derry of the de Havilland 110 with his observer Tony Richards the two men who were killed in the distressing crash, and Neville Duke, the Hawker Hunter. 
The launching and successful first flight of the long-range Saunders Row Princess flying boat had been one of the big aviation events of the summer. Now the huge vessel wings proudly over Farnborough on her ten engines. Four of the turboprop engines you can see are coupled units. Her accommodation for 102 passengers could be converted to carry 250 troops if need be. That brings us, by a natural transition, to military types. Starting again with trainers, highly important in the education of air crews in this jet age, the Canberra trainer is now seen to advantage in a spectacular sequence which shows off her amazing manoeuvrability. under the Canberra has caught on in the United States and is being built in Australia as well. A creation of the English Electric Company and also being built by such well-known firms as Shorts, Handy Page and A.V. Rowe, she is now being supplied to the Royal Air Force. The latest type flew across the Atlantic and back to Britain in an all-in time of 10 hours for the double journey. The faith of the English Electric Company in their first pioneering effort in jet aircraft has been abundantly justified. A new phrase, super priority, has been invented for Britain's rearmament drive and in super priority production for the RAF is the Supermarine Swift. A single engined fighter, although her two intakes like elephant's ears on either side of the fuselage may give the impression of two engines, she is certainly of distinctive design. has a London to Brussels record to her credit, averaging 665 miles per hour for the 200 miles. That is completing the journey in just over 18 minutes. The most revolutionary fighter in super priority production for the RAF is the twin-engined, delta-winged, blasted javelin. She's a two-seater, long-range, day and night fighter, radar equipped, capable of flying faster than sound. Is the Delta the design of the future? Many authorities seem to think so. Experiments have been conducted by a number of aircraft constructors since the war, but the Javelin is the first Delta fighter to be put into actual production. Resembling those paper darts with which boys at school amuse themselves, you might think that she had her own peculiar quirks and tricks which would require patient study to understand and master. But according to her test pilot, the Javelin's flying and handling characteristics vary little from those of the conventional flank wing aircraft. Notice as she banks and climbs that she leaves a trail behind each wingtip. This peculiar effect is created by atmospheric conditions, not exhaust fuel. The Valiant is an old friend from the previous year. She was ordered by the Air Ministry straight from the drawing board and first flew in May 1951. With her four Rolls-Royce turbojet engines, She's believed still to be the most formidable bomber of her class in the world and is, of course, capable of carrying an atomic weapon. 
one of the great achievements of the firm of Vickers Armstrongs, and of course in the super priority class. Arriving with the two delta-shaped research aircraft from which he was developed, the Avro Vulcan bomber was top secret at Fandra. She wasn't exhibited on the ground, and the only views which observers had of her were these. Like the javelin, she may represent the shape of things to come. Experts say the Delta design is certain to give great speeds over longer ranges at higher ceilings with maximum economy of operation. Here is the de Havilland 110. John Derry regularly on successive days put this twin-engined multi-purpose fighter into a supersonic dive. Minister of Defence, Lord Alexander, was there to see him do it. The tragedy, which occurred on the last day but one of the show, was not caused by the effect of piercing the sound barrier. Derry had flown to Hatfield and brought back another 110, not the aircraft shown in the earlier shots of this sequence. It was in the second machine that he dived through the barrier. Then he straightened out and circled the aerodrome. The catastrophe occurred when he was preparing to come in for his low-level fly past. Suddenly the aircraft was disintegrating in the air with engines and debris being hurled towards a section of the crowd. In spite of the tragedy to the 110, the test pilot of the Hawker Hunter, Neville Duke, forthwith took off his single-seater swept-wing fighter into the air for another supersonic demonstration. It was in a way a tribute to John Derry that his fellow test pilot paid in carrying on immediately with the activities which they had both pioneered. So the Hawker Hunter, which is also in super priority production for the Royal Air Force, shows off her dazzling qualities before the Farnbrook crowd. Again, the sound barrier is cracked. The Hawker Hunter, faster than the American Sabre or the Russian MIG-15, is the lineal descendant of the famous Hurricane. So once more, the Farnborough flying display of the Society of British Aircraft Constructors proved to be an epoch-making event. There had been tragedy, which had served as a reminder of the courage of pioneers, but the overriding impression was of new advances in the story of man's mastery of the air.